Hey, how's everybody doing this morning? Who is enjoying this weather? Come on. It's February and it feels like it's spring outside. I'll take it. But especially when it was like negative something this week. We had the first snow day I ever remember with no snow. Um, this happened this week. I'm sure the children weren't complaining. Um, but uh, my, maybe Bridget and I were around the house. Anyway. <laughs> Well, guys, I am so glad to be with you today as we are heading into, this is week five of our series called Relentless. Relentless is not just a series that we're in, it's the word that we're adopting for this year as God has called us to be relentless as we pursue him, to be relentless as we are just chasing down the dreams that he's placed in our hearts. We've been studying the life of the Apostle Paul. And uh, man, if there was ever any one person whose, whose life could be described as relentless, it would probably be this guy. I've loved getting into the Word every week and kind of talking about what God was doing through him. And we've got this week and the next week we're going to wrap things up. But it's, uh, it's been a real joy just to jump in, to dive in and see the way God's moving, the way God's working in the life of our church and to see how he's been doing this for hundreds and thousands of years uh, all around the world and we get to be a part of that. How exciting is that? Amen. Come on. Well, this morning we're going to be in Acts chapter 16. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to uh, Acts chapter 16. We're going to start here with verse 6. Uh, to kind of get us caught up, we, we, we know that the, a couple weeks ago we talked about the first missionary journey of Paul, how he, he stepped into his new identity as Paul and left behind the old identity of Saul, and, and how he has stepped into this brand new calling, this calling that God had given him to, to preach the gospel, to, to plant churches, to, to change nations. And there were some powerful things he had to do to get there, some very tough decisions he had to make, but to be relentless means that you're not going to let anything stand in your way. You're, you're not going to, you're not going to let anything keep you from doing that thing that you know that you're supposed to do. And that's, that's Paul's life. And so he began this second missionary journey that he's on. Now we're going to look a little bit here today. He has a new partner. It's Silas. Silas, who was, a, again, a powerful preacher and a prophet of his day. And he was traveling with Paul as they begin this new journey. And so they're already kind of in the journey. Verse 6 is where we're going to start off. It says this, that Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia. Man, this is one of those things they don't teach you how to pronounce in seminary. <laughs> but and Galatia says, and, but listen to this, because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. And so they were going a certain direction, but the Holy Spirit said, no, this is not where I want you to be. And so they had to change their route. They had to go another way. It says, then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. But again, the spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. That night in a vision, a man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. You know, one of the things I want to talk about here before we get any farther is, is just the way that the Holy Spirit guides and leads us in life. You know, if there's one thing that you learn how to do as a Christian, uh, this is one of the things I feel like is absolutely essential and vital to the walk that God has planned for you. If you want to have and pursue everything God has for you, you have to learn how to discern what the Holy Spirit is doing, how he's speaking, how he's guiding, and how he's directing. And this is the way that Holy Spirit works, is that Holy Spirit directs and checks. We are responsible for both. He directs and checks. He, he provides direction. He, he, he says, this is the way you need to go. And as we head that direction, you know, he, he affirms that. You know, he he kind of puts some things in our path that helps us know that we're heading down that right path. But he also checks. You know, there's a reason why these guys had to be reminded by the Holy Spirit twice that, that this is where you're supposed to go. Because Paul had it in his mind. Again, he was relentless. He wanted to go somewhere. Where he wanted to go was Asia. He was head this direction. Here's some people over there he wanted to reach. And as he went, the Holy Spirit said, no, this is not where I want you to go. Okay, so we're going to take a little detour, and I'm going to try to sneak back in. Has anybody ever done that? You know, you, you told your kids, all right, that's enough. No more Oreos. 50 seconds later, you hear this rustling sound in the cupboard. Still no Oreos. They thought your mind might have changed. That's sometimes what we do with God, right? We know that God has given us a specific direction, a certain thing that he wants us to do, and yet, 
For some reason, we think with a little bit of time that maybe God has changed his mind. But no, he, he didn't. And so as they, as they are following his direction initially, they start to sneak back to the path that they wanted to pursue. Again, this wasn't sinful. I mean, the first thing tells us that it wasn't the time. Timing's a big part of this. God has a plan, and it unfolds in his time. But as they were trying to go back, God, uh, the Holy Spirit checked them. See, we need to learn how to follow the Holy Spirit, to follow that direction, to listen and heed those checks. He guides us in several ways. One of the great ways he guides us is through prayer. I hope that you're developing and cultivating daily a strong prayer life. He, he speaks to us through scripture. I, I hope that it's something that you're building into your daily routine, your daily habit, that you would get into God's word so he can guide you through it. He often comes to us uh, through other people. Sometimes God will, will give a, a, a word or sometimes someone will say something to you and, and you don't even realize that, they don't even realize they're, they're saying something that's confirming what God's been saying to you. The Holy Spirit, and God, the Spirit moves, moves through several different ways in, in our worship, in our song. I mean, we can hear from God because God chooses to communicate in a variety of different ways. Sometimes he even gives a vision like he did here to some and it's a powerful thing when he does. But here's the deal. We listen to God personally, and we confirm it publicly. Because if we're not careful, our hearts, which Jeremiah said are deceptive, our wants, our rationale, can make us steer away from God's path. Now, that's what happened with Paul. And here's a guy that God was using in a powerful fashion to launch the church. And he had to be reminded again and again and again, what is the will of God? So it's something we listen to personally, but it's, it's something that he confirms in us publicly. So how do we tell if it's really God that's giving us a direction? I just want to kind of take this break for just a second. How do we tell? Well, there's some questions that we can ask. If you feel like God is leading you somewhere, if you feel like the Holy Spirit's pushing you a certain direction, one of the big questions that you need to ask is, does this line up with Scripture? And I think this is so important because I've, I've had this conversation many, many times with people who feel like God is calling them to something, but if we take a quick look at his, his word, we can see that that's not necessarily the case or it's certainly not necessarily the time. I've, I've had it said multiple times where someone came into my office and said, really, Kelly, I, I, think, I think God is calling me to, to leave my wife. Now we, we know scripturally that the Bible says God hates divorce. That, that God, doesn't, God doesn't wish that or want that for us. That this, is, this is not what God is calling us to. In the same manner, he's not calling you to leave your husband. Ladies, kind of get an amen. Come on, men. Amen. <laughs> but is what you feel like God's calling you to, does it line up with Scripture? See, here's the deal. God's Spirit will never lead you where God's Word prohibits you to go. And it's something we have to spend some time in his Word so we can discern these things. Next is, here's a question, you know, so if, if God's, God's calling you somewhere, if he's leading you somewhere, is, is this a consistent thing? I mean, they, they tried to go to Asia, the Holy Spirit said, no. So they wandered off somewhere else, they tried to go back to Asia, the Holy Spirit said, no, really, no. God tends to be very consistent. Now, I'll also say that, that he plans things out, he's a long-range planner, he, he, he knows the future. He knows what he's calling you to, and, and he also knows the timing and when it should happen. But here's the message. Is it consistent? If God is calling you to something, that message is going to be consistent. And, and the next thing is, is this the right time? Sometimes God says yes. Sometimes God says no. And the rest of the time, God says wait. He always answers your prayers. Are you willing to let God's timing take place? Scripture consistently teaches that there is a time for everything. A time for everything. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 talks to, us, talks to us about how there's a time for everything under the sun. And, and they even made a song about it. It was a big deal back in the day. But God's timing is perfect. And we need to wait for it. We need to prioritize it. The right word in the wrong situation at the wrong time is always wrong. We ask these questions. Here, here's another question. Whenever we feel God's leading us somewhere, here's, here's another powerful thing. What do people who love Jesus and love me have to say? One of the things I think is so amazing about this is when we read this story in Scripture, Paul never runs off just on his own. 
Before they took the first missionary journey, it was what? It was after a group of people worshiping God together came together and they knew they confirmed what God was saying together in prayer. Even the second missionary journey, Paul left and he went with Silas. He, he had somebody in his life who, who knew him, who loved him, who loved the Lord. And he was willing to listen to what they had to say. You need to have someone in your life who is honest enough, who, who loves you enough to be honest. You can't just be looking for yes people. You can't just be looking for someone to confirm all the things that you want to do. You need to have someone who loves you enough to be genuinely honest. How can you tell who those people are? How can you tell who those people are as they are real friends? There's a few things I'll tell you. Number one, you can tell if someone is your real friend because if you have a booger in your nose, they will tell you about it. <laughs> They're not afraid of that awkward conversation that goes, you know, they'll say, hey, listen, you got to pick that thing. And I know this is awkward, but how many times have you had a conversation where, with someone and, and maybe your fly was down, but they didn't tell you. They knew about it the whole time, and then they will let you walk out and stand in front of a whole crowd of people. <laughs> Were they really your friend at that point? We have to have friends who, are, who love us enough to be honest with the things we don't see. Who love us enough to, to tell us things that they, they don't know for sure if we want to hear. A real friend will love you enough to confront you if your thinking is skewed. You know, a lot of times we will do things that we think are led by God. In fact, we'll find a Bible verse that even backs it up. But because we are motivated the wrong way, we have so closed our hearts and hardened our hearts to what God has to say, we wouldn't know it. Because sometimes we get hurt. And we will over-spiritualize our pursuit of justice. And we will do things, say things, and go places that God has not intended us. And we will give him credit for leading us there. And if you have someone in your life who really, genuinely loves you, they'll pull you to the side and they'll say, hey, hold on. I don't think this is of God. We need to deal with this. You've got to have that kind of person in your life. Next question is you say, what other confirmation do I have that this is God's leading? One of the most important things you can look at is, do you have the gifting? Has God shaped you for this thing? You see, before Paul became this powerhouse apostle, he was already raised up under the greatest teachers of all of Israel. He had already become a powerful teacher in his own right, a powerful speaker in his own right. He grew up debating so he knew how to present an idea. See, God had prepared him even before he was following him to become the man that God needed him to be. He had a unique gifting to follow this call. Moses. Moses was raised in the home of Pharaoh, a prince of Egypt. And in that time, he had a powerful experience where he gained a deep knowledge of how to lead a multitude of people. I mean, God is so purposeful. Everything he does has a purpose. And that day, they put that baby in the basket. They had no idea that that boy that floated down the stream would be the one who led them through the waters. But God knew. God knew. John the Baptist, raised to be this powerful prophet, to make way for the king, his mother and his father came from a line of priests. We're talking about people who were called by God, but they were also gifted for it. God provided them the experience they needed to go where he had called them to go. He not only chose them, but before they even bowed to that call, he prepared them for the work that they didn't know they were going to do. They were gifted and prepared. You have to ask yourself the question, if you feel like God is calling you to something, is do you have the gifting? Has he provided you the experience? And then what do you need to do to get it? The last question I think is so important that we have to ask is, do you have the faith? Do you have the faith? God has put this thing in your life. God has put this thing in your heart, and the difference between a, a wish and, and pursuing the destiny he has is you have the, the faith to take the step. we got to have the faith to pursue the things that God gives us. God, I want to just tell you right now, if God has given you something, and you, one way to know what's from God is because it's bigger than you. It's something you cannot do on your own. That's a powerful truth. 
Has he given you the faith? Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Do you have the faith? Faith is vital to the Christian walk. Which among us, who among us, would say, I've got enough faith, I don't need any more. So the question is, how do you build your faith? I mean, if you know what God's calling you to, but you don't have the faith yet to get there, how do you build it? And I'll just tell you a really simple answer. The quickest way to build faith is to practice it. It's just like muscle. Whenever we, when we start working out, my kids are into weightlifting right now. They're all just strong and muscled up. It's unbelievable. But I want to tell you something. They are stronger today than where they were six months ago because they go in that weight room and they, they work it out. They don't start with where their max is today. They start with where their max was and they push things and it continues to grow. Your faith is the same way. The easiest way to practice faith is to start living according to God's command. God wants us to trust him enough to, to follow him and to do the things that we are called to do. Not because it will get you into heaven or help you avoid hell, but because you trust that God's way truly is better than your own. We look at God's plan for marriage and sex, and we submit to it. Not because necessarily that's what we want or what we desire at the time, but because we trust that God's ways are higher than our ways. When we look at our God's plan for our time, talent, and treasure, we submit to it. Not because we think he's going to give us something special, but because we honor him with our lives. Faith pleases God, and, and we are pleased with God. When it comes to having faith, you've just got to take that step. Faith is ultimately proven by obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commands. It starts in the small things and, and it grows. And as we are more and more faithful and more consistently faithful, our faith grows and becomes this powerful, powerful thing. So we have to learn how to follow the Spirit. We have to grow in the things that keep us more in tune with what the Spirit is saying. We have to build that discernment. Paul and Silas were prevented from preventing speaking in Asia for that time, which means it wasn't time yet, that God had another plan for them, another plan for that area, but it wasn't a yet time. We know God wanted to save them, but it just wasn't that time yet. We have to trust God to get that timing right. And so as they listen to round number two of no... They decided to head another direction. It says this in verse 11. We boarded a boat in Troas and sailed across uh, the, to the island of Samothrace. The next day we landed at Neapolis. From there we reached Philippi, a major city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We stayed there several days. Verse 13 tells us that on the Sabbath we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer and we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshiped God, and she listened to us. The Lord opened her heart, and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her household were baptized, and she asked us to be her guest. If you agree that I'm a true believer, come and stay at my home, and she urged us until we all agreed. So this is part of that Holy Spirit-inspired detour. This was not where they had planned to go. Paul had other ideas. And they showed up in this place, and here's an interesting thing, this, this little city, this little town called Philippi, it was a bustling economic center. There was a lot of people coming through this area, but as they were looking around, walking around, there was no temple. Now see, during that time, you had to have a certain number of Jewish men in a city for the Sanhedrin to consider sending their resources to go and build a temple. They did not have the number of Jewish men that they needed and so what they would do is they would establish houses of prayer, and they almost always established a house of prayer somewhere near a source of water. And so Paul and Silas, they, they thought, hey, there's other Jews in this area. We're going to go flock and be with our own people, our own kind. And so they went to this, this area. They, they went to the, where they could find this, this house of prayer, and right there they found a group of women praying. That's interesting. In a city where there was not enough men to build a temple, you still had a stronghold of women who were dedicated to God and given, they had been given themselves to prayer. Can I tell you something? I am so thankful for godly women. 
I am so thankful for godly women. God has such a high view of women that he trusted a woman to bring Jesus into the world. You know, God didn't have to do that. He could have made Jesus as a man and sent him on his own. But he brought a woman into the story and said, you know what? I want you to have my child. I want you to raise my child. I want you to teach my child how to be the man that I've called him to be, that I've made him to be. He trusted Mary. He trusted a woman. And God has such a high view of women that when Jesus revealed who he was, the first person he revealed it to was the woman by the well. What a powerful story. See, People have taught for so, for so long that, that women are somehow lesser than men. That we, they've blown the idea out of the water. It's, it's not a biblical idea. God loves women. There's a lot of talk about feminism today. But I want to tell you something. There's never been anyone more for women than Jesus Christ. And he guides us. He guides them into powerful, powerful righteousness. I'm so thankful for godly women in my life today. I'm so thankful for the women who took a stand for Christ. I'm so thankful for the women who, who carried our family in prayer. In fact, my whole family story was changed. If you go back and look at our family tree, it was changed by a godly woman who was married to a good man who didn't love Jesus. And she consistently lifted his kids and her kids. They, he got, they got married and he had eight kids. And it's a long story. It's another sermon. Maybe I'll tell it one day. But she came into eight children. She won them all to Jesus. And she had eight more, and she won them all to Jesus. And that man who I'm named after, he lived with her for decade after decade after decade, but her fervent, consistent prayer eventually before he passed away won him to Jesus too, and it has changed the course of my family's history. I am thankful for godly women who are committed to prayer. I hope you're thankful for them too. This is the kind of woman that Lydia was. She's mentioned specifically for a reason. She is the first European convert to Christianity. A, a devout Jewish woman who loved God with all her heart, but who then opened her heart to the gospel and she became changed. And immediately in that time, we see that her whole family followed suit. She had such tremendous influence that when she gave her life to Christ, the whole family gave their lives to Christ. Parents, we need to embrace that role today. I love this story. We don't, don't, don't know the story of what happened. We just know that her husband wasn't there. It, we're, we're led to believe that he's not in the picture at all. So we don't know if he passed away. We don't know if he left. We don't know the story. But we do know you have a woman who is, who is a single mom. She's an anomaly because she's also a, a, a dealer in purple clothes, which, which means she was a very uh, successful businesswoman because they, they dealt with the wealthy and the royal. She had a unique level of influence, a unique level of wealth. And from the very beginning, she began to, to share all of this and do all of this in the name of Jesus and used her influence and her wealth for the sake of Christ. When we read the book of Philippians, we're reading a book that was written to the church that was meeting in her house. A powerful woman of faith who gave herself in every way to the service of her Lord. See, faithful obedience endures long after we're gone. Faithful obedience endures long after we're gone. She not only led her family to salvation, she let God use her influence to build the church in that city and around the world. She funded the work that was done throughout Europe from that point on. Paul and Silas... They were influenced by her as well. They weren't going to go to her house. Maybe they thought it was inappropriate. Maybe, maybe they thought that there was something about it that they shouldn't do. They didn't know her very long. But she insisted that they come so that she could show them hospitality. She taught them what a welcome home experience actually felt like. Faithful obedience endures long after we're gone. You want to talk about an incredible investment? That's a credible, an incredible investment. God used her in a way that few can ever claim to make an impact that few could ever make. And it happened because she was willing. Lydia loved God. She followed the Holy Spirit's guidance. And as a result, God used her to change a continent. I mean, this is a powerful, powerful story. We, we don't read a lot about Lydia. She's only mentioned over the scope of a few verses in Scripture, but we know that her life had a tremendous and powerful impact. Now, I'll admit, when I read this story, I'm, I'm, I, I kind of I kinda get a little bit, little bit jealous because I want my life to have that kind of an impact. I want God to use my life in that kind of a way. 
But there's only so many opportunities to be the first convert on a continent. There's only so many stories, to, opportunities to be the, the first person to give that much. I mean, there's only so many opportunities to be that first person. But yet, almost 2,000 years after the Bible has been written, we, we, we can read this and understand that the story of the salvation of man by the grace of God is not yet complete. God is writing it day by day, and by our faith and obedience, we will be written into that story or left in the margins of history. You see, God is still writing the story of the salvation of mankind. In 2 Corinthians 3, it says, clearly, you are a letter from Christ, showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is not written with pen and ink, but with the spirit of the living God. It is carved not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. I wonder what your story will be. I wonder what God will write with the story that you are leaving behind. How will your chapter read? See, in this whole series, the thing we've been talking about is the fact that God has a plan for your life. That God has a work that he's called you to do. God has a work that, that, that is set aside specifically for you that he's been planning since the foundations of earth for the beginning of time. Now, make no mistake, God's plan is so big that if you choose not to follow it, he will raise someone else up and they will receive the blessing. Don't forget that. Don't put yourself in a place more important than God, but do understand that God's plan for you is still here and it's still powerful and it's still available. And he's asking us this question, what what are you doing to live that plan out? Your significance is tied to living out this plan. One day, a young lady named Lydia, she went to pray with her friends in the church by the river. The next day, God used her to change the nations. There's no telling what God will do if we are just obedient and we serve him. But where there is a great move of God you'll often find opposition. And that's what we see happening here. It says, one day as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. We'll call her Madam Chloe. <laughs> she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. She was annoyance. She wasn't helping. She was mocking them. She was causing problems for the work that God had called them to. And so Paul, as gently as I'm sure he could, says this, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it instantly left. And when it left, there was no more spirit and no more fortune, which meant no more money. This is verse 19. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities in the marketplace. The whole city was in an uproar because of these Jews. They shouted to the officials. They're teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. And a mob formed against Paul and Silas. The city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten. They were taken and thrown into a prison. And the jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and clamped them with their feet in stocks. The attack of the enemy isn't only spiritual. Sometimes it's as real as it can be. One of our pastors in Ethiopia, Emmanuel, was locked up for six months purely for preaching the gospel. For six months, he spent his time in, in prison and in jail. This was, this was just a few years ago. They tore down his church piece by piece. But something powerful happens when we're under attack and we keep our focus on Jesus. Verse 25 says, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. When you're going through trouble and still find a reason to praise God, people always stop and listen. Rather than complaining and causing a fuss about what had happened, they praised God in their change. They weren't putting on a show. They were authentically praising God in a desperate situation. And then suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations and the doors immediately flew open and the chains fell off every prisoner. You see, worship has the power to do that. Worship will open doors that have been locked and it will loose chains that have held you back for far too long. Paul and Silas were locked up literally, but many, many of us remain in the prison of our minds, but worship can change that. 
When we worship, we tune ourselves into the living God, God who knows no limits, God who cannot be bound, God who can do all things. And as we worship him, we begin to remember and connect with the fact that we are made in his image. We remember that he put us on, on this earth for a reason. We remember that God sent Jesus to die for us, that we get the eternal question of heaven and hell answered. Yes, but because he has a powerful work on this earth for us to do. See, worship changes mindsets. When we engage with God in worship on a regular basis, we find ourselves being and doing and becoming more and more like him in every way. God was working through their prison experience. He was moving even in their captivity. And as they worshiped, the very ground that they were standing on shook. See, worship reminds us that we're free, that God is with us no matter what circumstances we face. See, Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And worship proclaims that. Worship proclaims a truth that cannot be taken from us. Paul and Silas found themselves wrongly in prison, treated so poorly. In the middle of that, they began to pray and sing the glory of God. Their chains fell off and they didn't run away. I wonder why. I wonder why they didn't run when they could have. The freedom seemingly had been handed to them, but they didn't run. I wonder why. It's, it's because of this. Because God had called them to reach that island, that, those people. And they had a captive audience. And as they praised God in the middle of that difficult situation, people saw some powerful things take place. The jailer woke up, the prison doors were wide open. He assumed everyone had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. Paul shouted, stop, don't kill yourself, we're all here. See, it turns out that that jailer was more bound than any of the prisoners. But when Jesus sets you free, you're free indeed. See, God does his best work in prisons. If you're stuck in a prison of your mind, if you're stuck in a prison of your heart, if you're stuck in a prison of, of, of your own building, I want you to hear this. God does his best work in prisons. Joseph would have never saved his family had he not gone through the pit and the prison. Samson brought out an entire empire when he was in chains. Jesus would have never went to the cross had he not been under arrest. God does his best work in prisons. But not because you're in prison. But because we make the choice to walk in the deep truth that we are free indeed. That he has broke our chains. That we are free in a way where no man could ever bind us. But if we're going to live in that reality, if we're going to follow God's spirit, it's a choice that we have to make. So this morning as we close the service, I'm going to invite us to worship. And as we worship, if you have been bound, if you feel like you're in a situation where you need some freedom, if you're in a situation where you need hope and encouragement this morning, I'm going to ask you to sing. I'm going to ask you to lift your voice. You may sound like a coyote in a trash compactor, but God said just make a joyful noise. So let's stand. We're going to praise God in the middle of our prison. We're going to praise God in the middle of our situation. We're on a journey seeking his direction. We're going to praise God in his correction. We're going to praise God. Amen. Amen. Father God, we thank you. God, that as we pursue you, you give us everything we need to, to, to have success on that journey. God, you grant us the faith. You grow us as we obey. Father, you shine your light into our darkest situations. God, you are the one who opens the doors and you set us free. God, I pray that as we leave this place today, Father, that our hearts will be so tuned in with you that we would know exactly where to place every step. God, give us faith. God, help us to feel the power of your spirit in our lives every moment. God, for those of us who maybe haven't made a decision to follow you, I pray that today, right after this service, they would come up and have a conversation that could change everything from this point on. God, we love you.
praise you for who you are and what you do. We give these lives to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace. Have a beautiful day.